Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome each of you to our Easter celebration service. We're absolutely delighted that you've joined with us and to those joining us online as well, we bid you a warm, uh, warm welcome on this Easter day. The announcements have been circulating on the screen, so I hope you had an opportunity uh, to read through them. The announcements have been fairly, fairly light uh, this week because we're in kind of holiday mode. Um, do just remember at 6.30 tonight, there is an evening worship combined churches evening worship in Donna Cloney Presbyterian and everyone's welcome uh, to come along to that uh, this evening uh, at half past six. The preacher tonight will be the Reverend Mark Haw, uh, the minister of Waringstown Presbyterian Church. I want to say thank you to those who came along to the various services throughout the last week. It was a, it was a busy week, but it's been a good week as we've journeyed to the cross uh, with, with Jesus through the scripture readings from Mark and from John's uh, Gospels. Next Sunday, the services are as normal, 10.30, or sorry, 10 a.m. in St. Patrick's, 11.30 here in Holy Trinity. Uh, and then next Sunday night, uh, we're back here in Holy Trinity at 6 p.m. Uh, for, for evening worship. So do also bear that in mind. Just as we prepare to worship God on this uh, Easter Sunday, it is a service of both word and sacrament, where we hear the word of God read and proclaimed and where we gather around uh, the Lord's table. And we'll think a little bit more about that later on. But there is, uh, there is no Sunday school. And so therefore we're going to let the boys and girls just for a few moments leave church. They're going to go into the vestry as they did last year on Easter day along with, uh, with Lisa, and maybe somebody could go in with Lisa just to help her out when that happens, and then they're gonna come back out and show us what they've created, which will be placed alongside our, our garden tomb scene uh, a little later in the service. But I invite you to please stand for our Easter acclamations. So please stand. So Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We sing together our opening hymn. It's hymn 271. Jesus Christ is risen today. Hallelujah.
hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy on us and write these your laws in our hearts. Let us then confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to intercede for us in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Lord God, you raised your son from the dead. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, through you, we are more than conquerors. Christ, have mercy. Holy Spirit, you help us in our weakness. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing together the hymn version of the Gloria, Glory in the Highest to the God of Heaven. for this Easter Sunday morning. Almighty God, through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, you have overcome death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. Grant that as by your grace going before us, you put into our minds good desires, so by your continual help, we may bring them to good effect through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 
Our reading this morning can be found on page 815 of the Pew Bibles. And the reading is from Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and reading from verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. So we sing together our gradual hymn, See What a Morning Gloriously Bright, The Calling of Hope from Jerusalem. Hear the Gospel of our Saviour Christ according to St. John, chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. 
Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped round Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And I speak in the name of God, who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to stay here because, as you will have discovered already, we're having a few microphone problems and, well, this one's wired in. It's a bit like myself. It's wired up. Uh, this one's wired in, so I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay here uh, this morning. Um, but we, here we are, Easter Day, once again, finding ourselves gathered together as church with those welcome proclamations of Christ is risen and that delightful response of... Oh, well, you're nearly there. It's okay. It's okay. I'll teach you yet. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We'll try it one more time. Christ is risen. Ah, you're getting there. We'll go one more time. It's like the children's talk this this morning. All right, you ready? Because it's jubilant. That's why we're here. Do we really, really earnestly believe it? That Christ is risen? Ah, you're good. We'll make, we'll make Pentecostals out of you yet. Christ is risen. He is amongst us. He walks with us. He talks with us. He shows us along the way of life's journey by the power of the Holy Spirit. We do not do it on our own. It is impossible to do it on our own. But God, in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, walked on that first Easter morning straight out of that tomb. As we journeyed last week through Holy Week, we journeyed towards the cross. And as I said on Friday evening, all four gospel writers tell us about his death. There were hundreds of witnesses to his death. We looked a number of weeks ago at the start of our mission, what crucifixion actually means. And nobody could have survived what Jesus went through. The 39 lashes. The reason there was not 40 is because the Roman world believed that on the 40th the person would die. 39 of them. 
he received from us. Walking through the streets of Jerusalem on his torn back, carrying a cross to that place called Golgotha, where he was nailed to it and he hung on it. And if you need even more evidence than that, they pushed a spear into his side to make sure that he was dead, flowing the water and the blood from him. There is no question of it. Jesus died. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all tell us about it. The disciples, 11 of them, preached it for years. They saw it. His mother, Mary Magdalene, the other woman, all saw it. There was no doubt in it. Joseph from Arimathea asked for his body, took him down from the cross, wrapped his body in those linens with the, the, uh, the, the fragrances that was required, the ointments, the herbs that were required for Jewish burial. There was absolutely no doubt in it. And failing that, he was then sealed in a tomb. Not just laid in a cave, but actually sealed inside it. Placed where Roman officers were put at the door of it just to guard it for fear that someone might steal his body for the Jews were so obsessed by this, the Jewish authorities. And while inside that tomb, yes, a, a hole in a rock, a small cave placed inside it, the stone placed over the door of it, that door sealed it would have been impossible for Jesus to have opened it from the inside as a human man. Impossible for man to open it on the outside without breaking the seals and without being seen by officers, by centurions, by others passing by. And yet, on that first Easter morning, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb and sees that it is open. The seals have been ripped apart. And as John tells us, as we read a few moments ago, the stone had been removed from the entrance. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The angels sat where his body lay, one at the head and one at his feet, just to proclaim that the Son of God has triumphed over death. In Mark's account, because all four gospel writers agree on the resurrection as well, the historical facts are there as well as the biblical truths. Mark, in Mark 16, we read about how that Mary Magdalene, going to the tomb with the other woman, asked the question, who will roll the stone away? They knew they couldn't do it themselves. They just weren't strong enough. It would take several people to roll that heavy, heavy stone away. And yet all four Gospels tell us it was moved. It had been pushed to the side. For Jesus to walk out of that tomb, for Jesus to walk free in human form, the stone had to be moved. Death could not hold him. The stone had to be moved. And he walked forth into the light of a new day. I think that stone actually represents quite a lot of things this morning. Not just Jesus rising from the dead, but the stone represents a blockage. It was the stone that held him there for three days. But what blockage is there in our lives from fully experiencing the resurrection of the risen Christ? What stone needs moved? What stone needs rolled away in our lives? Those stones in our lives are put there by sin, and sin separates us from God. And it is only God who can roll it away. We cannot do it on our own. God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, through the death and resurrection of his Son, can move even the largest of stones. God can shift a mountain that's in our way from experiencing him. But we have to ask him to do it. Sin creates that separation from God. 
Sin like pride. Sin like stealing, telling lies, committing adultery, not honoring those that are set over us in the Lord, our father and our mother, for example. Sin are coveting our neighbor's possessions, the things that our neighbors have. Sins of taking the Lord's name in vain. Sins of breaking the Sabbath day and not keeping it holy. Sins of making idols in our lives and worshipping them. Sin of not putting God first. The Ten Commandments that we heard read time and time again during the Lent season. Those things block us from fully encountering the risen Jesus. And it is only God who can move those sins from our lives. It is only God who can roll that stone away. And we need to be so, so careful to not ask God to forgive us of one sin and then substitute it with another sin. That could so easily happen. For the last 46 days and nights, 40 days of Lent and the six Sundays if you kept them as well, you'll have had a Lenten observance. You'll have done something, no doubt. And as I said on Ash Wednesday and said it a few times since, Lent is not about the waistline, it's about the spirit line. But we all do the fun stuff or not so fun stuff of the waistline as well. You give up the sweets and the chocolate and all that sort of stuff. And do you know, folks, I'm going to confess, confession time for the rector. For me, this has probably been the worst Lent yet in that it's the first Lent that I remember where I've actually put on weight. But it's not about that. But we find that when we give stuff up, we substitute it with something else. I'm off chocolate. I'll still have a digestive biscuit. I'm off crisps. I'll still have a handful of nuts. We need to be careful that whenever God removes boulders from our lives, that we replace it with the things of God and not the things of the world. Look at the Gospels. Look at what happened. Was the tomb empty? In essence, yes, Christ had walked away, but the tomb was filled with the presence of God and was represented by the presence of angels, one at his head and one at where his feet were. We need to ask God to not only remove sin from our lives, but to fill that gap with him, with his Holy Spirit. We cannot do it alone. It is impossible for me, it is impossible for you to remove sin from our lives. No matter how many prayers we pray, we cannot remove that sin from our lives without confessing that sin to God and asking him to forgive us. No matter how many responses we make in church of Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. If we don't do it with earnest and contrite hearts, it does not remove the sin from our lives. No matter how many times I stand at the front and pray that prayer, asking God to forgive us of our sins. It does not forgive our sins unless we sincerely seek God. We need the boulders rolled away. I think of an old gospel hymn where the chorus of it says, rolled away, rolled away, and the burden of my heart shall roll away. It is only God who can set us free. It was the move of God that set Jesus free on that first Easter morning, and God sets us free. And the joys of being set free by Jesus is that when we are free, we are free indeed. We're free to enjoy all that God has in store for us in this world because Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it to the fullness. But we're also free to know that we have the assurance of enjoying all that God has in store for us in the next world, in heaven, that place prepared for us, that place where we are free, free indeed. A hymn that is often sang on Easter Day. It's somewhere in some services. You may hear it on TV later or on the radio. We're not singing it here this morning, but we might at some stage during the Easter season because it lasts for weeks. 
is he lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me, he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives salvation to you in part. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. The resurrected Jesus longs to live in our hearts. Just open your heart to him this morning and say, Lord Jesus, please fill the voids, fill the gaps, push out of me all that is not of you and let me live as people of the resurrection. Easter day is not just one day in the year. As God's children, as church, regardless of what season we find ourselves in, whether it's Easter or Pentecost or Trinity or Advent or Christmas, we are still people of the resurrection. Every time we meet together as church, whether it's a small group of us in somebody's home or whether it's a prayer ministry team or whether it's a Bible study or whether it's Sunday worship or midweek worship, Every time we meet together as church, we are people of the resurrection. Because Jesus said, when you meet together in my name, there I am in the midst of you. He is here because he is risen. And we are his people and we need to live like his people. We need to let him speak words of peace, speak words of truth, speak words of love into our lives. So that we will speak words of truth, words of peace words of love into this darkened world. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. May God's name be praised. Amen. I'm going to go to this door because I hear noise coming from it. So I assume the kids have finished what they've been preparing. Uh, You'll remember for those of you that were here last year, On Easter Day, they took an oasis in the shape of a cross and they filled it full of flowers and it's going to be placed beside our our empty tomb scene, uh, my right to your left. Do take a look at it as you're leaving church this morning, just to remind us, it's symbolism, to remind us that Jesus is risen from the dead and I'm going to see how they're done. Are we done? Okay. (laughs) They're carrying it ever so tender. Oh, we're working again. They're carrying it ever so tenderly, aren't they? Well done, boys and girls. Excellent. Well done. Now, thank you very much. Is it safe for me to hold? What do you think, folks? Does not look well? Okay. Now, we're going to go and we're going to place it over here. And then we're going to pray a special prayer thanking God for this Easter day. Okay, so let's just pray together. Lord God, we thank you for the beauty of creation and for how that this morning the beauty of creation is reminding us of your sacrifice, but also your resurrection for us. Father, may the message of the cross and the message of the empty tomb always ring true in our hearts and in our lives. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls. Thank you to your helpers as well. Well done. Well done. Easter Day was, in the early church, often the day that was set aside where new believers would be baptized into the fellowship of the Christian church. 
Lent having been that period of preparation. And as I say, every year on Easter Day, if there are any adults in church who have not been baptized but would like to go through the waters of baptism, please come and have a chat with me. Uh, and I would be delighted to bring the hot tub back into the church uh, just to, to ex have, that, uh, have that service with you and for you. But also on Easter Day, we who have been baptized are given the opportunity to reaffirm our faith, to say to God, the promises that were made at my baptism, whether it was on our behalf if we were babies or like myself, an adult, and made them myself, I'm recommitting myself to serving, loving, and working for uh, the risen Saviour. So I invite you to please stand as we do that now. As we celebrate again the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we remember that through these saving acts we have died and been buried with him in baptism so that we might rise with him to a new life within the family of his church. We now meet to renew our, knew the promises made at our baptism to affirm our allegiance to Christ and our rejection of all that is evil. So therefore, I ask, do you renew and affirm the promises made when you were baptised? Do. do you turn in faith to Christ? I do. do you renounce all evil? I do. Will you obey and serve Christ? Do you believe and trust in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, in Jesus Christ, who redeemed us from the world? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God? I believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. Having confessed our sins in faith and said, Lord, I follow you and renounce everything that's to do with evil, we now commit ourselves to following Jesus the rest of our days and serving him wholly. Will you persevere in resisting evil and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? Those who are baptized are called to worship and serve God. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers? Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? You've all just said you're going to be evangelists. Spread the word. Spread the word. Will you seek and serve Christ in all people, loving your neighbour as yourself? And will you acknowledge Christ's authority over human society by prayer for the world and its leaders, by defending the weak, and by seeking peace and justice? You've all just said, I want to be a pastor. May God give us evangelist hearts and the hearts of pastors. And let us need our sit as we pray. Almighty God, you have given us the will to do all these things. Give us the courage and strength to achieve them to the honour and glory of your name and the good of your church and people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you may be rooted and grounded in love and bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. Merciful Father, accept these our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We say together, we do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, 
so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Please stop. The risen Christ came and stood amongst his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then they were glad when they saw the Lord. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace in whatever way you feel is most appropriate for yourselves. As we prepare to receive from the sacrament of Holy Communion, I want to thank those who prepared the church so beautifully for today's service, did the floral <coughs> decorations and spent time uh, yesterday uh, putting everything back together after we had dismantled it for, uh, for Thursday evening. Remember, as we come to Holy Communion, it is a solemn act because we are remembering the passion and death of our Lord Jesus. We are looking for his resurrection uh, or for his ascension, his promise to return uh, through it. We eat the bread, we drink the cup in remembrance of what he did for us and what he promises to do in us. It is the feast for the believers. So for those of you who know and love the Lord Jesus as your personal saviour, draw near in a few moments and receive it. Receive the bread, receive the wine. For those who are visiting with us in church this morning, if you take communion in your own church and you know and love the Lord Jesus, then you're welcome to come and receive here uh, with us as well at the front a little later on. At this stage, we say goodbye to our online viewers as well and wish you a very happy Easter. We sing the hymn, Hail Thou Once Despised Jesus, Hail Thou Galilean King. And let us praise God together. Mm -hmm. 